In Chapter 4, we will discuss the demanding ethical and social responsibility of businesses in the world. The learning objectives in Chapter 4 are one, to explain why obeying the laws is only the first step to behaving ethically. Two, ask the three questions you need to answer when faced with politically unethical actions. Number three, describe management's role in setting ethical standards. Four, distinguish between compliance-based and integrity-based ethics codes and list the six steps in setting up a corporate ethics code. Five, define corporate social responsibility and compare corporations' responsibilities to various stakeholders. And finally, number six, analyze the role of U.S. businesses in influencing ethical behavior and social responsibility in the global markets. You will often find that celebrities help develop ways to fund problems in the world in order to help developing countries where well-being and economic growth suffers. As noted on the slide, actor Matt Damon who's an engineer and entrepreneur, as well as Gary White, founded the organization called Water.org. It helps families access microloans to fund their own water operations. They also formed Water Equity to invest in various enterprises, giving the profits to underprivileged people. It's a pretty significant amount of people that Water.org helps. It's 4.6 million. So they help people with clean water and sanitation for the past seven years. Let's get this chapter started with a trivia question. Name the company that's helping reverse the decline in the environmental health of our planet by donating time, services, and at least 1% of its sales to environmental groups all over the world. Do you know the name of this company? If you answer Patagonia, you're correct. Given the ethical lapses prevalent today, how can we restore trust in the free market system and leaders in general? First, those who have broken the law should be punished accordingly. New laws making accounting records more transparent, easy to read and understand, and business people and others more accountable for their actions may also help. But laws alone don't make people honest, reliable, or truthful. If they did, crime would disappear. This slide is an interesting slide when we think about ethics and scandals. In 2016, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau fined Wells Fargo $185 million for creating more than 1.5 million fake accounts and 500,000 fraudulent credit cards and customers' names without their knowledge. This brought widespread attention to a number of other scandals associated with financial services firms, which has resulted in Wells Fargo paying out billions of dollars in lawsuits and settlements. Now, I read about this scandal, I don't know, um, in, a, in my undergrad studying, um, and just recently, I received a letter from Wells Fargo telling me that they weren't able to open up an account in my name without any kind of identification. So knowing about the scandal, I immediately called Wells Fargo and they said, yes, ma'am, we understand, you know, that you didn't open this because we actually put a stop to it being open in a second time. So we're well aware that this is a problem. And so when I brought up the case, they immediately apologized and tried to reassure me that it had nothing to do with um, the fake accounts that were created, but still makes you wonder. The next two slides are gonna be some details about some of the largest corporate scandals, probably in the last 20 years, maybe more. Um, the big one on here on this slide is in regards to Enron Corporation. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, the former CEO, the current CFO, and the current CEO were found guilty of committing accounting fraud by moving billions of dollars of debt off their balance sheet that artificially inflated the company's stock and bond prices. So that's a big time no-no. 
The executives sold millions of dollars worth of stock just before the fraud became public, while the company's pension regulations prohibited regular employees from selling their stock. So the result of that was the executives who bankrupt the company made millions while employees and other small investors lost $74 billion. We're talking pensions and, and everything. So people that have worked a lifetime for Enron lost their pensions. Um, so one of the, the former CEO died prior to sentencing, but the CFO served four years and Skilling, who was the current CEO, received a 24 year sentence. But in 2013, he struck a deal to reduce his sentence by 10 years for giving $42 million back to the victims of Enron. Skilling was released in 2019. So, and I'm not sure when he was sentenced, but still $42 million, did it even cover all these people who worked a lifetime for these pensions that were never able to retire? So that was a huge scandal. Um, and then there's more in the following slide. Moving on to more of the largest corporate scandals is the big one that comes to mind here is um, the Bernie Madoff investment security scandal. So I've actually watched a movie on this and granted it, it was a lot of Hollywood, but it still kind of gives you an idea in a nutshell what happened here. So Bernie Madoff tricked investors out of $64.8 billion. One of the largest Ponzi schemes, Madoff paid investors returns out of their own money or the money of investors instead of out of profits. It was said at one time um, he was, I want to say worth over $120 million. Um, and that, no, actually it was $823 million. Um, he was sentenced to 150 years plus had to pay $170 billion in restitution, which, in, as you know, even when he, he did get caught and his net worth was discovered, he never had, a, you know, that much money to pay them back. Um, his wife, his kids, they all suffered as a result. And I mean, when we talk about the Madoff um, investment scandal, there were tons of movie stars like Kevin Bacon, if you ever watched the original Footloose movie, and his wife, and I mean, tons and tons of people from all different walks of life, from the rich to the poor to the, you know, the super rich got caught up in this scandal. So it's important to really make sure that um, when you are investing, that um, sometimes when something seems too good to be true, sometimes there's a reason because it is. So always trust your gut and make sure you do your research and educate yourself on, on you know, potentials of a Ponzi scheme or other things. The reputations of American businesses have been under assault due to numerous scandals over the past 20 years. Following the law is only the first step to being ethical. Ethics are standards of moral behavior and are accepted by society as right versus wrong. Few Americans have moral absolutes. It's important just to think about the golden rule. Common standards of ethical behavior come from religion or the golden rule, which means do unto others as you wish them to do to you. Ethics begins with all of us. The opposite of ethical behavior is unethical behavior. Some examples of unethical behavior are listed on the slide. For example, when you're in the office, instead of doing your work, you're goofing off, you're talking to your coworkers, you're playing games on your computer. That's a good example of unethical behavior. From a personal standpoint, not volunteering to help your community and um, help society grow just like you've had the chance or at school, playing on the internet, not doing your work, plagiarizing work that you found on the internet. All some real life examples of how unethical behavior affects your life. This slide is really just to kind of emphasize how ethics really begins with you. Um, as you know, um, when you go to work, sometimes you're tempted to be on your phone, playing games, talking to friends, 
texting or, or whatever you might do on your devices. But think about how that makes you look from an ethical standpoint. Um, some, some say that when you're using your phone on personal time or playing on the internet, you're stealing time from your manager or your, the company for, for all intensive purposes. Um, you know, and think about what the consequences of each thing that could happen to you. You could get wrote up at work for not doing your work. You could maybe eventually be fired for it, but you don't do the right thing just because of that. It's because you, you really want to project yourself in a positive way. Um, you never know um, who you might meet later in life. And if you've ever heard, don't burn bridges, this is an, an idea of how a bridge might get burned. If you play a lot on your phone while you're at work or um, or in other situations where you need to be paying attention, um, you might run into that person that constantly might remind you you're not supposed to be on your devices. So, and later in life, who knows when you might walk past that person or they might work at a company where you want to work and they, you know, with the hiring manager might say, oh, you know this person? Well, you know, what do you think of them? And the only way they know you is from, say, working at McDonald's and you were on your phone all the time and weren't ever doing your work. So, and that would be just one way that they could give a negative input towards a hiring manager and you could potentially not get the job. So anyway, just, just think about how different ways that you can let ethics um, play a big part in your success in life. It can be difficult to balance ethics and other goals, such as pleasing stakeholders or advancing in your career. When thinking about ethical dilemmas, think, ask yourself the following questions. Is my proposed action legal? Am I violating any law or company policy? Whether you're thinking about having a drink and driving home, gathering marketing intelligence or designing a product, or just using a questionable nickname, think about the legal implications. Second question, is it balance? Am I acting fairly? Would I want to be treated this way? Win-lose situations often become lose-lose situations and generate retaliation from the loser. An ethical business person has a win-win attitude and tries to make decisions that benefit all. And third, how will it make me feel about myself? Would I feel proud if my family learned of my decision, my friends? Could I discuss the proposed situation or action with my supervisor? Has someone warned me not to disclose them? Individuals and companies that develop a strong ethics code and use these three questions have, been, have a better chance than most of behaving ethically. The Making Ethical Decision Box gives you a chance to think about how you might make an ethical decision in the workplace. Ethics are society's accepted standards of behavior. In other words, behaviors accepted by society as right rather than wrong. Ethics reflect people's proper relationship with one another. Legality is narrower in that it refers to laws we have written to protect ourselves from fraud, theft, and violence. It helps to ask the following questions when faced with an ethical dilemma. Is the proposed action legal? Is it balanced? Would I want to be treated this way? How what will it make me feel about myself? Leadership helps to instill corporate values in employees. So like many aspects of business, ethical behavior practiced and modeled by managers and executives will often trickle down to the employees at large. Trust between workers and managers must be based on fairness, honesty, openness, and moral integrity. Overly ambitious goals and incentives can create an environment in which unethical actions can occur. Ethics begins with the individual, but are often influenced by the organization and the environment in which the business operates. So from an individual standpoint, you think about the values that you were instilled with from your family, um, your work background, 
um, your personality, and, and even your family status. From an organizational standpoint, think about the top level management philosophy. So when you're looking to interview with a job, um, that's a good question to ask is what is the company culture? What is your management philosophy? Because if it doesn't agree with, you know, what you work best with or from an ethics and morals perspective you agree with, then it might not be a good idea to work for that organization. Uh, look at the firm's reward system. Is, is, are the goals too high? And do, is there potential for people to make unethical decisions in order to achieve those goals and ask about the job dimensions. From an environmental perspective, think about competition, economic conditions, and social cultural uh, institutions on how, um, you know, from an environmental standpoint, how you feel about those items when it comes to your own personal and uh, moral and ethical standards. More and more companies are adopting written codes of ethics. Uh, Compliance-based ethic codes, which emphasize preventing unlawful behavior um, by setting controls and penalizing wrongdoers. So a good example uh, at the company I work for, um, the controls that we use are, <clears throat> we have a quality assurance department that um, ensures quality within the company, but they also establish what we call SOPs or standard operating procedures. And if people are not following these standard operating procedures, they're gonna find this out during a quality audit. And um, the quality uh, director answers directly to the president of the company. So that way when there is a major quality or ethics violation, um, we would go straight up into the president and, and involve our general counsel. So then we also have integrity-based ethics codes that defines the organization's guiding values, creating an environment that supports ethically sound behavior and stresses shared accountability among employees. Um, so that might be, um, you know, something that we talked about earlier in the slides of um, making sure you're coming to work on time. Um, and if you leave early, you clock out at the time you leave. You don't go home and wait till it's time to clock out at home. Um, you know, your regular time's five o'clock, but you left at four, which we've seen that happen before. And, and sometimes it's obvious and other times um, you catch that kind of thing because, you know, people are whistleblowers and um, they let management know. So that would be a good integrity-based ethic violation. This slide gives you an example of a code of ethics for Hershey's. Um, and if you wanted to read more about it, you can always go to Hershey's website and look for their code of conduct. But as you can see on their code of ethics on the screen, um, their code of ethics is in their commitment to their co consumers, to the marketplace, to the stockholders, and then to the global community. So this is all the kind of things that you want to see when you're um, either looking to do business with a company or even working for a company. You want to make sure that they have that commitment to all the stakeholders. This slide shows strategies for ethics management. There's features of compliance-based ethics codes and features of integrity-based ethics codes. I'll let you review them. Integrity-based ethics codes move beyond legal compliance to create a do-it-right climate that emphasizes core values such as honesty, fair play, good service to customers, commitment to diversity, and involvement in the community. These values are ethically desirable but not necessarily legally mandatory. There are six steps that it is believed that can improve U.S. business ethics. The first one is top management must adopt and unconditionally support explicit corporate code of conduct. And I've always said, as long as you have buy-in from the top when you're trying to institute new rules or policies, then people will listen. Pe most people will listen and will fall in line and do what they need to do. 
Uh, employees must understand the senior management expects all employees to act eth ethically. And if they aren't specifically saying this, some people just won't listen. Managers and others must be trained to consider the ethical implications of all business decisions. So for instance, um, this really, I guess, is kind of a business decision, but also a um, personal decision. So at the company I work with, we deal with a lot of companies that are developing new drugs. Um, one ethic violation would be us knowing that a new drug's being developed to cure cancer, hypothetically. Um, and we go and buy a bunch of stock from this particular pharmaceutical company. That would be considered an ethics violation and considered insider trading, which you can go to jail for. Moving on, um, the number fourth ethical standard is an ethics office must be set up with which employees can communicate anonymously um, unethical um, business practices. So this would this kind of office or hotline that could be developed so it goes directly to this office, it's where whistleblowers can report that illegal or un unethical behavior. Um, involve outsiders such as suppliers, subcontractors, and distributors and customers and with your ethical standards like we were talking about on that Hershey's Code of Ethics. Um, the ethics code must be enforced with timely action if any rules are broken. So within that ethics code, there would be, you know, a stipulation on how quickly um, the executives would react when there are unethical um, codes of conduct broken. So going back to the Ponzi scheme with Bernie Madoff, um, there was a whistleblower that actually um, kind of warned the FBI that this Ponzi scheme was going on. Um, he frequently notified the Securities and Exchange Commission about his findings. He was an, a forensic accountant, um, and but they just never listened because Bernie Madoff was the superstar. He was so popular and everyone loved him. But until uh, Bernie Madoff's own son let the FBI, FBI know of the scam, they did not act on it. So think about what might make a whistleblower act to turn something somebody in. Um, we're going back to those questions that we asked earlier. Um, if I found out that there was a scheme like that going on and I didn't say anything, uh, I could think about, boy, what would my family think? How would I feel if somebody did that to me? I mean, those are just, I mean, some of the few questions you could be asking yourself, but um, a lot of times that's, I mean, just a highly ethical person would do in order to decide that they're gonna be a whistleblower and make this man suffer for what he's doing to all these people. If you are in a circumstance on um, where you have to become a whistleblower or know somebody that might need to be a whistleblower, think about the items on the slide. Decide that you're gonna do it and act quickly. Sometimes people get scared. Sometimes people um, get anxiety and then decide not to blow the whistle. Make sure you have all your allegations filed with the right agencies. So that's really important to do your research or um, talk to a lawyer, ask a, a professional that would know how to um, make these allegations. Gather your information legally. Don't hack into a computer and get the files. Get it, get it the right way. And lastly, stick with the facts. Only talk about the facts because if you exaggerate things, it'll be discovered and could end up working against you. Compliance-based ethics codes emphasize preventing unlawful behavior by increasing control and penalizing wrongdoers. Integrity-based ethics codes define the organization's guiding principles, creates an environment that supports ethically sound behavior and stress shared accountability. The six steps many believe will improve the U.S. business ethics are Top management must adopt and unconditionally support explicit corporate codes of conduct. 
employees must understand the expectations for ethical behavior beginning at the top and that senior management expects all employees to act accordingly. Next, managers and others must be trained to consider the ethical implications of all business decisions. An ethics office must be set up with employees that can communicate anonymously. Outsiders, such as suppliers, subcontractors, distributors, customers, must be told about this ethics program. And finally, the ethics code must be enforced with timely actions if rules are broken. Corporate Social Responsibility, or CSR, is based on a commitment to such basic principles as integrity, fairness, and respect. Many for-profit companies have, have philanthropic endeavors as a part of their mission. Communities often depend on companies to help with social programs that make the lives of people in the community better. It stands to reason that businesses that strengthen their communities, as proponents of CSR argue, will grow stronger as their communities improve. There are different dimensions of company social performance. The first is corporate philanthropy, which includes charitable donations corporate social initiative, which includes enhanced forms of corporate philanthropy directly related to the company's competencies. Next, corporal responsibility. This includes everything from hiring minors, working to make safe products. And lastly, corporate policy, the position a firm takes on social and political issues. This slide is a list of some very generous celebrities where you see George and Amal Clooney at the top who, who established the Clooney Foundation for Justice and the UN Messenger of Peace, or you think about Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey earns well over $200 million per year and donates nearly $50 million. The talk show host and entertainment mogul is the founder of the Angel Network. The Angel Network is a charity that raises money for poverty-stricken children, and she has raised money to open schools for girls in South Africa. I mean, just that is just such a wonderful thing that these people that have more money that they could ever spend in a lifetime, that they spend developing these organizations to help people that, you know, truly need it. I mean, even looking at Matt Damon, this H2O for Africa, I mean, that's really just giving, healthy water supply to people in need in Africa to where the population is so poverty stricken. I mean, just getting enough food to eat is a problem. Just the basic needs aren't met and being able to provide them with water not only gives them a way to, you know, have enough fluids, but also to farm, you know, to, to grow some of the basic needs, which are food. You would be surprised about the amount of money that very wealthy people donate to charities every year. Um, so not just in the previous slide talking about celebrities, let's talk about million and billionaires. Um, like Warren Buffett, everybody's heard about War Warren Buffett. He um, uh, established the Gates Foundation and social justice initiatives, and he is the Boy, he's the biggest donor by far by donating $3.45 billion a year. And then, of course, Bill and Melinda Gates are, you know, $2.6 billion. But even if we go to the very bottom of this list, Gordon and Betty Moore, they're, they're donating $298 million for conservation. And everybody else, you know, they have their own initiatives that they care highly about. Um, you know, you see conservation, you see education, you see climate change. So it's it's all a, a lot of times these million and billionaires, they, you know, move towards social responsibility, but in things that have really touched them in their life for one reason or another. The problems corporations cause get so much news coverage that people tend to get a negative view of their impact on society. But businesses do make positive contributions too. Many companies do allow their employees to volunteer their time and help social agencies. For example, um, the company I work for, 
were allowed to um, use eight hours of leave time. It's called volunteer leave time um, each year to a, um, a something of our choice. It, so it, whether it's volunteering at your daughter's school or volunteering for a homeless shelter, you can use that eight hours. Um, in addition to that, they also offer kind of like group teamwork kind of efforts where um, they can go out and make a positive impact at a, um, a elementary school that's in our area that has a lot of homeless children that go to this school. So there, I mean, there's very positive ways that companies can make a good impact on their communities and, you know, through society in general. The majority of millennials surveyed said they would take a reduced salary to work for a socially responsible company. Let's look at the concept of social responsibility through the eyes of stakeholders to whom businesses are responsible customers, investors, employees, and society in general. So if you take a look at the slide, there's examples of companies' social responsibilities efforts. So the big one, of course, everybody knows Starbucks. When the South American coffee crops were dying from coffee leaf rust, Starbucks R&D farm developed the rust-resistant coffee plants. The company, by doing this, improve the lives of coffee growers by giving them superior seeds to more than a million farmers and workers across seven countries and three continents. Other companies like Harmless Harvest, Zipline International, PepsiCo, Panera, McDonald's, and Nestle, are, these are all examples of uh, companies being socially responsible to their stakeholders. This slide also continues to go through companies that have made social responsibility efforts through time. So I'm just going to jump right in there with Intel. The technology giant is helping build a workplace capable of keeping up with the digital revolution. The one thing I love about Intel is that of its TEACH program that helps the K through 12 teachers integrate technology into their classrooms with things like STEM, the science, technology, and engineering math to make sure that people have the skills to move into the future. President John F. Kennedy proposed four basic rights of consumers. One, the right to safety. Two, the right to be informed three, the right to choose, and four, the right to be heard. These rights will be achieved only if businesses and consumers recognize them and take action in the marketplace. The reoccurring theme that we see throughout this book is pleasing customers by offering something of real value. Since three of five new businesses fail, we know this responsibility is not as easy to meet as it seems. One sure way of failing is to please customers is to be less than honest with them. The payoff to please customers is to get new customers and increase business with your existing customers. Given the value customers place on social efforts, how do companies make customers aware of such efforts? One tool that you all probably know of very well is social media. The primary value of using social media to communicate corporate social responsibility efforts is that it allows companies to reach a broad and diverse group, allows them to connect directly with the customer in a low cost but efficient way, and enables them to interact with specific groups more easily than through the traditional efforts, like Gen Z. Gen Z is, represents up to 40% of the global market and has estimated purchasing power of $44 billion. It's not enough for companies to brag about their social responsibility efforts. They must walk the walk and talk the talk. So if they aren't meeting up to the expectations of the consumers, they will face consequences by losing consumers in business. Some do's and don'ts when thinking about social media customer contact, um, say for instance, by using Twitter for business. Um, create discussions relevant to your industry, but don't start political rants because 
there are some people when you start bringing politics into the situation that turns them off and they're gonna go the opposite way and find another business to work with. Think about your message before you post it because as you know, once you post it on the internet, it never goes away. So um, just a, a note that those deleted tweets can be found. So don't, pulse it, or don't post impulsively. One thing that I learned very early on in my career is when you're mad or very passionate about something, don't write an email and send it right away, especially if you're upset. Type it out or even in your iPhone, get your notes, type it you know, on your notes and then come back a little later and reread it because there's nothing worse than getting a wrong, wrong word in um, your message, having misspelling or grammar issues. It just looks bad on you. So always think about that first before you post. Um, offer new and engaging content. Don't let you know the post be about the same thing all the time because when you do, um, the account will lie dormant. You'll have less views and less, um, you know, likes on your posts. Create separate accounts for both business and personal use and make your announcements via your company accounts um, and for business and then use your personal accounts for your personal use. So I mentioned earlier about um, unethical issues involved with insider trading. So when you think about insider trading um, from a company that say, for instance, the pharmaceutical company, um, you want to be responsible to your investors. So when you do enter into that insider trading activity, um, it's, it's using that private information to build your own fortune for whether it's for you or family and friends the SEC can, will investigate if they feel that there is some unethical violations and they will look at all avenues on how you as an employee may have impacted somebody else by giving them information about a new drug or a new product that's coming out that's gonna be worth you know millions of dollars. Somehow they are able to trace whether it's you know through a spouse, a cousin, a brother, they will interview all these people that may have somehow come into contact with somebody at a company that breached that ethical, unethical way. Uh, when I say that there are a lot of unethical dealings out there, you know, in, in public, I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, what's important before we go over this slide is to make sure you're doing your homework. If you hear any negative information, um, go the other way. That's why it's so important to make sure um, that you're, as a, as a trader or you know, a stockbroker, that you are known for doing the right thing all the time. You can't make those you know, small mistakes because it could threaten your career. So this insider trading um, was in 2014, a judge sentenced a former hedge fund trader. And a hedge fund trader is really somebody that buys and sells different currencies. And um, they might buy the currency when it's worth, say the Euro is worth $1.10. And then later the value goes up, say to $1.50. So they, they um, sentenced this former trader to nine years in prison for overseeing the largest trading scheme in history. While working as a portfolio manager or also known as a stockbroker at a SAC Capital, um, he made a series of uh, illegal trades that earned him $275 million. And, and again, when you're thinking about, you know, doing certain activities, you always have to say, is this legal? you know, what would my family think of me if they found out I did this wrong? You know, just remember, it may seem like, wow, what a great idea. But it, I mean, you know, this this guy knew he was doing illegal things. Um, he, th this guy managed to avoid jail, but he was forced to pay $1.8 billion in fines. Now, how in the heck can you pay $1.8 billion 
um, if you only earn 275 million. So, I mean, it makes me wonder how he could ever, you know, get to that point because once you have been convicted, once you're a felon for doing things like this, you can't work in that business ever again. So it just makes me wonder how um, a judge and would allow this kind of deal to go through. But just an example of things that are out there. So just make sure you're doing your homework. And if, especially when it comes to your retirement funds, to money you're investing for you and your family for your long-term, you know, livelihood that you're doing your due diligence when you're looking to invest in, in um, different companies or um, hedge funds and things like that. Next, let's talk about corporate responsibility to employees. Businesses have a responsibility to create jobs if they want to grow. Once they've done so, they must see to it that hard work and talent are fairly rewarded. Employees need realistic hope of a better future, which comes only through a chance of upward mobility. If a company treats employees with respect, those employees usually will respect the company as well. Mutual respect can make a huge difference in a company's pro profit. The companies with contented employees outgrow their counterparts by four to one for more than 10 years. One way a company can demonstrate commitment and caring is to give employees salaries and benefits that help them reach their personal goals. The wage and benefit packages offered by warehouse retailers like Costco are among the best in hourly retail. Even part-time workers are covered by Costco's health plan and the workers pay less for their coverage than other retailers like Walmart. Getting even is one of the most powerful incentives for good people to do bad things. Few, dis excuse me, few disgruntled workers are desperate enough to commit violence in the workplace, but a great number re relieve their frustrations in subtle ways, like blaming mistakes on others, not accepting responsibility, manipulating budgets and expenses, and so on. The loss of employee commitment, confidence, and trust in the company and its man management can be costly. Um, and it's like the owner of the company we work for is the best advertising for a company is the employees. The more they are happy with the job and are have the buy-in of the company, the more they can tell other people about it. So for instance, um, you know, me, I love the company I work for, so I'm gonna tell people about it. And those people might wanna come to work because it's fair wages, they have great benefits, and you know, they've been named you know, one of the top employers in the United States to work for. So that is the best advertising you can get for a company. The next corporate social responsibility is the responsibility to society and the environment. More than 10% of U.S. workers in the private sector receive salaries from nonprofit organizations that receives funding's from others that in turn receive their money from businesses. Foundations, universities, and other organizations own billions of shares in publicly held companies. As stock prices of those firms increase, businesses create more wealth to benefit society. Businesses are also partly responsible for promoting social justice. Many companies believe they have a role in building communities uh, that goes well beyond simply giving back. To them, charity just isn't enough. Their social contribution Contributions include cleaning up the environment, building community toilets, providing computer lessons, etc. The carbon footprint of a package of, say, frozen corn includes not only the carbon released by the fertilizer to grow the corn, but also carbon in the fertilizer itself. The gas used to run the farm equipment and transport the corn to the market, the electricity to make the plastic packages and freezers, and so on. So as you can imagine, you know, this, the green movement is really pushing companies to lessen that carbon footprint. The green movement has provided consumers with lots of product choices. However, making those choices meanings have um, sorting through many and confusing claims by manufacturers. The noise in the marketplace challenges even the most dedicated green activists 
but taking the easy route of buying what's most readily available violates the principles of the green movement. Environmental efforts may increase a company's costs, but they also allow the company to charge higher prices, increase market share, or both. 90% of millennials say they are willing to pay more for products with environmentally friendly ingredients. Green products have been steadily increasing in the market from 19% in 2014 to 25% in 2021. The green movement can have a positive impact on the U.S. labor force. Emerging renewable energy and energy efficient industries currently account for 9 million jobs um, by the time 2030 comes around. There will be 40 million more in engineering, manufacturing, construction, and so on. Environmental quality is a public good. That is, everyone gets to enjoy it regardless of who pays for it. So the challenge for companies is really to find the public goods that will appeal to their customers. An example of a business that is socially responsible is a business uh, like Patagonia's. They were uh, established back in 1973 and they sell outdoor apparel um, and their, their mission is to make quality goods in an ethical manner. They do this by vetting their suppliers and you know all of the stakeholders um, that are involved with their business in order to make that positive impact on the world. So knowing this, that they're trying to do the socially responsible thing from a corporation standpoint, would you pay more to, to buy something at Patagonia, knowing that they're doing the right thing for society? The way we measure whether or not an organization is being social responsible is by doing a social audit. A social audit is a systematic evaluation of an organization's progress towards implementing social responsibility and responsive programs. One of the major problems of, of conducting a social audit is establishing procedures for measuring the firm's activities and their effects on societies. What should the social audit measure? Well, there are five types of ways of um, doing the social auditing by using what's called is watchdogs. First, socially conscious investors insist that a company extend in its own high standards to its suppliers. Since social responsibility investing is on the rise, about $12 trillion is invested in SRI funds in the United States already. Two, socially conscious research organizations analyze and report on corporate social responsibility efforts. Three, environmentalists <clears throat> apply pressure by naming companies that don't abide by uh, environmentalist standards. An example of one of these might be um, you may have heard of protests regarding San Francisco-based Rainforests Action Network or J.P. Morgan Chase and Company uh, adopting guidelines that restrict its lending and underwriting practices for industrial projects that might have an impact on the environment. Fourth, union officials. Union officials hunt down violations and force companies to comply to avoid negative publicity. And finally, customers. Customers make buying decisions based on social conscience. Many companies surveyed are adjusting their environmental and social responsibility strategies because the number of customers that factor these into their buying decisions. This slide represents uh, the most admired companies of 2020 for corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility is the concern businesses have for the welfare of society, not just their owners. The vast majority of the companies listed on the slide are not only admired, but they're financially successful. So just one more proof that being social responsibility does affect your bottom line in a positive way. Let's review. Corporate social responsibility, or CSR, is the concern businesses have for the welfare of society, not just for their owners. 
CSR defenders believe that businesses owe their existence to the societies they serve and cannot succeed in societies that fail. CSR must be responsible to all stakeholders, not just investors in the company. A social audit is a systematic evaluation of an organization's progress towards implementing social responsible and responsive programs. Many feel a social audit should measure workplace issues. The environment, product safety, community relations, military weapons contracting, international operations and human rights, and respect the rights of local people. Ethical problems and issues of social responsibility are not unique to the United States. Influence peddling or bribery charges have been brought against top officials in many other countries like Japan, South Korea, China, Brazil, etc. <clears throat> many U.S. businesses also demand social responsible behavior from their international suppliers making sure they don't violate U.S. human rights and environmental standards. <clears throat> In contrast, are companies that are criticized for exploiting their workers. So one company is Nike. Um, Apple also was criticized for violating rights of the workers. So those are a couple things that you can look up if you're interested in learning more about it. The fairness of requiring international suppliers to adhere to U.S. ethical standards is not clear cut, as you might think it is. For example, a gift in one culture can be a bribe in another. Is it always eth ethical for companies to demand compliance with the standards of their own countries? What about countries where child labor is acceptable because families need everybody to work in order to support the household? None of these questions are easy to answer, but they suggest the complexity of social responsibility in international markets. In the 1970s, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act sent a chill throughout the U.S. business community by criminalizing the act of paying foreign businesses or government leaders to get business. Many U.S. executives complained that this law put their business at a competitive disadvantage when bidding against non-U.S. companies, since foreign companies don't have to abide by it. To identify some form of common global ethics and fight corruptions in global markets, partners in the Organization of American States signed the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption. The United Nations adopted a formal condemnation of a corporate bribery, as did the European Union and the Organization for Economic Corporation, Cooperation and Development. The International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, published a standard on social responsibility called the ISO 26000, which guidelines on products and manufacturing fair pay rights, appropriate employee treatment, and hiring practices. These standards are advisory only and will not be used for a certification process. The formation of a single set of international rules governing multinational corporations is really unlikely in the future to fight corruption. As I mentioned in the last slide, there's been many companies that have tried to overcome you know, their ethical errors. Um, one of them was Nike where they had outsourced their manufacturing of its products overseas um, and had a lot of criticisms because in the nations where they um, did produce their product, um, it was very low wages and they were using child labor. It was very common to use child labor. Um, they've taken corrective measures, including working with the companies that they're um, making their products as well as um, having advocacy groups in order to set the standards for labor practices and the factories if they want their business. So, you know, everybody in the class probably knows who Nike is. And, you know, it's obviously that if you do the right thing, you can overcome your errors, but at what cost? What did it cost them over the years? So just a few things to think about. Um, and sometimes the, the unethical behavior is so great 
that um, there's no coming back from it. So um, do a little research and see if you can think of other companies or find other companies that may have gone through you know, similar issues. The one I had mentioned in the previous slide was Apple products. Um, they used Foxconn um, to develop their products. And I know there is a YouTube video out there um, that's pretty interesting um, to see. Uh, these people that made the Apple iPads don't even have them, but they're producing you know, at a rate so fast and they're given very little time to sleep or eat or even go home to see their families. So um, I think, you know, since the original um, video was shared and I mean, it was several years ago, they have made, you know, corrective actions in order to ensure that people are being paid a fair wage. And, um, you know, just from a labor standpoint, um, given, you know, more rest, but, you know, just a lot of, there's more than just one of these stories out there, but do a little research and, you know, just so you can understand some of the ethical concerns about doing business internationally. If you want to read more about ethical culture clashes, there's a whole article um, about reaching beyond our borders in the text. Um, it's on page 106 of the text. Talks about how somebody from South America moved to the U.S. for college and worked for a, a large company. Um, but while he was here, he was given a two month or a $2,000 stipend for housing expenses. Instead of um, using it all for himself, he was sending part of it back to help support his family. So with that in mind, think about how this could become an ethical dilemma here in the US, but maybe not so much for his home country in South America. I mean, we find this all the time. I mean, especially, you know, bordering Mexico where a lot of um, Mexican citizens come into the US because they can make more money here and they live on very little. I mean, a lot of them, you know, are housed together um, to, to keep their living expenses cheap so they can send money back to their families in Mexico or wherever they're from. I mean, we see this all the time. But think about, you know, you got two different countries, two different cultures, and and might what might be an ethical dilemma for one country isn't necessarily for their home country. Let's review. Many businesses now demand that international suppliers do not violate U.S. human rights and environmental standards. It's unlikely there will be a single set of international rules governing multinational companies because of the widespread disparity among global nations as to what constitutes ethical behavior. For example, a gift in one culture can be a bribe in another. In some nations, child labor is expected and an important part of a family's standard of living. The fairness of adhering to U.S. standards of ethical behavior is not as easy as you may think.